hello to the first ever Sky at Night from Stonehenge. It is, in fact, midsummer morning. There are a great many people here, as you can see, and in a very few moments, the Druids are going to bring, begin their main procession. Well, of course, everything depends upon whether the sky is going to be clear at that vital moment of sunrise over the heel stone. And I must admit that looking around at the moment, it doesn't seem very promising. But it's not hopeless by any means, uh, so we'll just go on waiting here and trusting to luck. And so let's hope that we do have a decent sunrise. Meanwhile, the excitement is mounting all the time as sunrise approaches. Look forward to the all-illuminating day. Flood it with mercy, with wisdom and with love, that we may go forth from this sacred place reflecting its light on all with whom we come in contact. And so, exit the Druids. I had the slightest doubt that the sun rose, but unfortunately we didn't see it because it was total cloud coverage. But it didn't stop the Druids holding their service, and um, after all, there's always 1973. Well, that was Stonehenge at sunrise this morning, and I thoroughly enjoyed the Druid ceremony. And the modern druids are very pleasant, very sincere people. But I think we've got to admit, you know, that neither the modern nor the ancient druids have any real connection with Stonehenge. Because Stonehenge is very ancient. It's more than 4,000 years old. And that's long before any druids came to Britain. But even if Stonehenge has no connection with the Druids, it's taken on a new significance for us recently, because we now know it's much more than simply a monument. It is also a kind of primitive astronomical computer. Now, one man who's done a tremendous amount of research into the astronomical significance of Stonehenge is Professor Gerald Hawkins. And uh, we are delighted to have Professor Hawkins with us now. And we've also got a rather splendid model of Stonehenge uh, made by Mr John Randerson. Gerald, I think the first thing to do is to ask you to explain, with the aid of the model, just which stone is which. This, of course, is the famous heel stone. It stands in the avenue, and there is the large ditch around it, and the bank, and then the 56 Aubrey holes set in an exact circle. Here we have the slaughter stone lying flat. The centre of Stonehenge today is uh, somewhat ruined by the ravages of time, but thanks to a long sequence of uh, archaeologists who worked at the site, dug below the turf and looked into the holes, we know what it looked like. This is Stonehenge in its heyday. The astronomical theory shows that these trilithon slots point to the rising and setting of the moon. Looking through them here, one would see midwinter sunrise. And of course, one of the most famous views of all is looking through this central slot over the hillstone where the sun rises on Midsummer's Day. It's very fortunate that that particular arch still exists. 
And of course, this is undoubtedly the most spectacular thing of all, the sun rising over the heelstone on Midsummer Day. But it very often happens that our Midsummer Day happens to be cloudy, as it was this morning, and then, of course, you can't see it. But it doesn't really make very much difference for two or three days on either side. Uh, and in order to give ourselves a second chance, so to speak, we went down to Stonehenge a day early. And on June the 20th, we were rewarded with a magnificent sight of the sun as it rose slowly and majestically over the heel stone. This must be very much the scene that was watched by the makers of Stonehenge so many centuries ago. Then, of course, the monument was a complete circle. Now, only parts of it are left. But the great arch is still there, and the sun will still rise over the heel stone. It's only minutes away now. There's a certain amount of low cloud down there, just a little mist, and that, I think, is going to be an advantage rather than anything else. It'll dim the sunlight down. This is going to be a really perfect view. There's the first gleam of the sun. It's coming up. You can see the sunlight now shining on the clouds and turning into gold. And I can just see the approaching disk of the sun. This is really magnificent. All the time, the sunlight increases. And the first rays now are shining on us, just as they shone on the builders of Stonehenge. Now we can see the actual disk of the sun as it comes up over those trees in the distance. And it's approaching the top of the heel stone now. Almost there, and in this setting, with those great stones round us, you can feel the full drama of it. Now, almost the half circle of the sun, rising with majestic slowness. <coughs> Getting so bright now that it's difficult to look straight at it. The real splendor of the sun is upon us. Through that great arch, the heel stone in the distance, the alignment absolutely perfect as the sun comes up to its rising point over the top of the stone. In just a few moments now, And there it is, there is the sun rising over the heel stone, as you see it from Stonehenge. And there are very many people who have never actually seen this. I've never myself seen it before, and it really is a superb sight. And I certainly won't have a better view of, the, of, of sunrise over Stonehenge than that. Well now, to recap for a moment, uh, let's go back to our model. There is the heel stone, there's the so-called slaughter stone, and there are some of the important Aubrey holes. And uh, to go on a kind of conducted tour of Stonehenge itself, let's begin just about there, looking along the so-called avenue. What exactly was it for, Gerald? Well, it marked the sunrise line. Uh, that was in the centre. And uh, 
Also, it was a place for bringing the stones, uh, hauling them up uh, from the River Avon, a distance of two and a half miles. Such as that chap, and I always wonder why he's called a slaughter stone. I take it that's not a sinister name oh, at all. A wrong name, of course. <laughs> it was originally upright and uh, could have nothing to do with a base for slaughter. It's been tipped over. Probably it was an astronomical marker in a hole beneath the turf. Any idea where it stood before it fell down? <laughs> there are several possibilities. There are holes beneath the turf, but uh, which one uh, really can't be established. Uh, it was perhaps uh, deliberately turned over. It's, uh, there's an attempt to bury it. I'm sure it was an astronomical marker that fell into disuse or some change of plan. Now, the dish is still well marked, too, and it's pretty old, isn't it, Joel? Oh, one of the oldest features by the new radiocarbon dating, probably uh, 2,500 or so. And what was that actually for? A great circular ditch, 300 feet in diameter, surrounding the area, maybe to separate it from the profane countryside, yes. but also as a source of material to build a chalk bank here. The ground slopes, and uh, this chalk bank could have been raised up so that there was a horizon at eye level as viewed from the center. I always find the heel stone particularly impressive, and I suppose you can call that the prime marker of Stonehenge. Very much so, the prime marker. It marks the midsummer sunrise as uh, seen through the two uh, main stones there in the center. Of course, it's tilted now. I'm sure it was upright originally, and uh, therefore it would stand a little higher as viewed from the center. Any idea how much it weighs? Never has been weighed, of course, but from its size, I would estimate 35 tons. 35 tons of sandstone. That's quite a weight. The Aubrey Holes. 56 of them. A significant number? Very, very, of course. Uh, the most critical number for the moon. Uh, it's uh, three nodal revolutions of the moon's orbit. When the Stonehenge uh, people came here, they started with these holes, the ditch, the bank, and this circle. And therefore, uh, they indicated that they knew what they were doing right at the very outset. Well, do tell us exactly how they were used. I've suggested that uh, they were a counting device. They don't mark anything, but uh, they will foretell what will happen year by year. and. Uh, Originally, I would suggest, or I suggested that uh, they counted one hole each year and that they would mark it by a stone like this. Yeah. And this would tell them what was going to go on, uh, such as eclipses during the solstice. But a stone uh, is very easily displaced and uh, it might just get yeah. knocked aside. Uh, the archaeologists uh, found a chalk ball or an egg shaped object. Do you have a replica there? Rather a replica, yes. And, uh, this was found in hole 22. Perhaps this was when uh, Stonehenge went out of business. Yes. Uh, then Sir Fred Hoyle has suggested uh, a very useful point that the uh, Aubrey holes were not marked off every year, but counting uh, three years at a step. The beauty of this is that the replica of the moon god is keeping pace exactly in an analog fashion with the sky, and again will act as a predictor. Now, for example, if we're here this year, yeah. we would count three holes to bury the symbol for the next full year. One, two, three. So that we're over here. Yeah. Then this uh, could have been designated as the significant hole for the eclipses to take place in the lunation of the solstice. Well, 1973 example, is that yes, year. Yes, we've got an eclipse next year, June the 30th, 1973. Not, could you have predicted the, that? Well, certainly there. The ball is predicting eclipses in the period of the summer solstice of 1973. And when the moon is full, there will be an eclipse, the danger of an eclipse of the moon. And when the moon is new, the danger of an eclipse of the sun. Predicted. Because of the 56 Aubrey holes and because of the alignments here at Stonehenge, it could be said to be more a moon observatory than an observatory for the sun. And uh, just as the sun rises over the heelstone at midsummer, the moon rises over the heelstone at midwinter. Well, there's one difference with the moon. Year by year, it takes up a different position over a period of actually 18.6 years or three cycles, making 56. 
Now, we can't wait and observe year by year, but Patrick can demonstrate by moving one pace each year the positions of the moon. As he moves further, year by year, after five years, he reaches the extreme northerly position and will turn. Then the moon goes back till it crosses the heel stone, and again, after another five years from the heel stone, it turns again at its lower extreme. Then crossing back, after this period of 18 or 19 years, it's back over the heel stone. Now, that position with the moon over the heel stone at midwinter is very, very critical because that central position shows when the moon is in danger of being eclipsed, the awful moment of the eclipse of the midwinter moon. These trilithons at the center, these great archways, are transit instruments. Uh, each one points to a particular place for the sun or the moon. They're not made for walking through, they're made for looking through. They're observational. Uh, you can't walk through there, Patrick. Well, have a go. All right, challenge right, you, no. have a go. <laughs> no. no. Are you, are you stuck? Uh, <laughs> no, you just can't. <laughs> no, you cannot no, walk can't. through. Now, this particular archway was used for observing over there the mid-winter sunrise, and it's a very accurate alignment. Well, Stonehenge is massive enough it's not only Stonehenge, there are plenty of other stone circles around also, some of them quite near. And I'm thinking particularly, of course, of Woodhenge, which is only a few miles away from Stonehenge. And it's not nearly so spectacular, because little of it remains above ground. It's built on a different pattern, and it was certainly set up for a rather different purpose. But in its own way, it's pretty nearly as interesting. And so, we went to Woodhenge, too. Woodhenge today does look like a forest of small concrete pillars because, of course, the original structures are long since rotted away and these are merely used as markers. They're quite modern. Gerald, tell us something about Woodhenge. Well, when it was first excavated, it was thought that it was a hut or communal <laughs> living uh, quarters and uh, yet it's more than that. An accurate survey shows that it has a very peculiar geometrical construction, uh, not circular but uh, egg-shaped, and the axis runs of course, again, to the midsummer sunrise. So it is, in fact, astronomical. Oh, yes, the whole thing is aligned on the same line that Stonehenge is uh, set. And there are other posts outside the structure that uh, point to uh, other astronomical things. Was it built by the same people? The same general culture. One really couldn't say the same people. Uh, the, the dates of these structures are not pinned down to even the nearest century. All we know is that there was a great activity over a period of one, two thousand years. Can you imagine from what's left now what Woodhenge must have looked like? Depends on the height of the posts. Uh, they might have been taller, they might have been stumps like this. Uh, I really couldn't say. I feel sure that it was not a roofed structure uh, as some of the uh, uh, textbooks might have indicated earlier. But it was in fact very accurately laid out. Oh yes, it's really a numbers game, geometry and playing with uh, things that we would call esoteric. Joel, will you tell us something about this so-called megalithic yard, which does strike me as being rather suspiciously like the mythical Pyramid Inch? Well, Professor Alexander Tom of Scotland has suggested that everything in ancient Britain was in multiples of 2.72 feet, megalithic yard. Uh, here, as well as pointing to the sunrise, these uh, very peculiar egg-shaped circles play a numbers game. Their perimeters are even multiples of megalithic yards, uh, 40, 60, and so on. But, of course, they might be just paces of human beings, or they might be arm's length. And uh, here we might perhaps have 20 people at arm's length forming this egg-shaped perimeter. Well, as you know, we have got an experiment lined up, and we've got exactly 20 helpers from the Amesbury Secondary Modern School. And they're going to arrange themselves round the inner stone circle with their arms outstretched. Remember, there are exactly 20 of them. And when they do that, you will see they do form an exact circle. And it really is amazingly precise. There they are. It does work awfully well. Now, Joel, what do you think of that? Well, these uh, young men and women are representative of our modern race. And uh, let's take them as representative of the megalithic race. Uh, each one stands for two megalithic yards, 20 of them forming a very neat perimeter. If we could have ten more, they would fall back in this enlarged egg-shaped perimeter to the next circle. Ten more again to the next circle. But what is important here is that these megalithic people were interested in numbers. 
non-literate, yet mathematical. Uh, what these numbers meant to them, we cannot imagine. But something magic, perhaps, something occult, but here, the number 20, we're worshipping it in a circle. The number 30, with 30 people, would be worshipped in the next circle. I use the word worship, but I mean uh, they were somehow obsessed with numbers as well as the sky and geometry and alignment. So it does look to you very much as though the so-called megalithic yard is not significant and is simply merely indicative of the length of arms outstretched. It might be that uh, distances were measured as we measure with chains, distances were measured with human chains. When we began this experiment this afternoon, we had no real idea whether it was going to work or not. Well, as you can see, it does. And we are very grateful indeed to our helpers who came along at very short notice to help us with it. And remember, this experiment hasn't been tried at Wooden Hedge before. Um, at least, not for the last 4,000 years or so. Well, Woodhenge is interesting, but as I said, not spectacular. And if you want something really spectacular, I think Avebury has it with the village inside. Oh, yes, uh, that's a grand circle. And buried beneath the turf are two circles, one here and another here. And the line between them points to a particular star. The number of stones in the outer perimeter here is probably another astronomical number. Much research is needed on these structures. And then, of course, going north, we come to Callanish. And that's really yes. an interesting one. Yes, at Callanish, it's the latitude that's very important. Uh, it is at latitude 58 degrees. Uh, above that latitude, the moon in its minimum does not rise. Uh, Stonehenge is also at a latitude which makes a rectangle. The latitude here is uh, 51.2 uh, degrees. And of course, Callanish is, in a way, like a miniature Stonehenge. I've been there. Yes, Callanish has alignments and uh, points to the sun and moon. You can see the alignments in the rows of stones. There is one row that runs out here and another back here, pointing in one case to the sun and one case to the moon. There are many alignments there. Anything like the heel stone? Yes, uh, there is an avenue. Uh, the avenue runs along towards the southern point of the moon, the, where the moon skims the horizon. Well, of course, so far we've been talking about stone monuments in Great Britain, but we haven't got the monopoly of them. And, of course, um, I'm thinking of Karnak. I assume you've been there. Yes, our cultural lens overspills to Europe, and uh, in the, whatever it was, common market of those days, there was a, a general interest in this uh, subject. Karnak, these long rows, are run parallel. It's in Britain, isn't it? Yes, and if one were to stand there, they would have a perspective vanishing point, and the moon, or sun, would be right at the end of the row. Well, earlier on, we were talking about the dating of Stonehenge, and I suppose that goes for Woodhenge as well, and it looks yes. now as if it's more or less contemporary with the pyramids. And I just wonder whether there's any tie-up with the pyramids, or the Sphinx, or Amun-Ra, or any of these things over in Egypt. Well, there is a tie-up in that uh, similar things were going on. Whether there was communication between the various people, we don't know. The pyramids, uh, as most people know, are aligned north, south, east and west. And looking along one edge, the uh, sun would appear to rise on March the 21st or September the 23rd. It's a very exact alignment. Also, in Egypt, of course, we have uh, the other things like the Sphinx. Now, the Sphinx is a structure that uh, faces exactly due east. One wonders where the eyes point to. What is the Sphinx looking at? The Sphinx is waiting for the sunrise on March the 21st. And between the paws of the Sphinx uh, is a temple dedicated to Ra Hor Akhti. There is another temple uh, down the Nile, the great temple of Amun Ra. Again, this temple has an axis which is carefully constructed and which uh, I'm um, working on at the moment. I haven't yet published it, but which points to the rising of the moon at midwinter. Again, this uh, obsession with the sky and linking the structures with the heavens. Well, I'm afraid um, I've not seen Amon Ra, and I don't suppose there are very many people watching at the moment who have, but a lot of people by now have seen Stonehenge, and so let's come back to that, shall we? Jevil, you've been carrying out research now for a very long time, and what do you think is the most important point that's come out of it? Stonehenge has led us to the cultural lens. It's led us to this field of astroarchaeology. There is more in an ancient structure than first meets the eye. There is a quantitative basis. I think it has led us into the mind of ancient man, and we have found that he was connecting the earth to the sky, to the sky gods by these imaginary lines, and he was interested in his environment. And perhaps he had something in his culture that we are struggling for in our difficult uh, culture today. Gerald, thank you very much. And so, next time you drive along Salisbury Plain, perhaps you'll look at Stonehenge with a new interest.
It's much more than a mere monument. It's an astronomical computer as well. And when we look at those giant stone blocks, I think we've got to have a very healthy respect for the men who built it more than 4,000 years ago. The stones are still there. They'll remain, we hope, in the indefinite future. And uh, near midsummer, we can still watch the sun as it rises over the heel stone. Good night.